Ghibli has an approach that's identifiable at just a glance. And if the studio has a house style, it also has several themes it explores from different angles throughout its 20 plus feature films. Environmentalism is a frequent concern, for example. More intriguing, however, is the fascination with the line separating fantasy and reality, and the role escapism serves in coping with trauma. Whether it's stated outright or not, it's often easy to read the fantasia presented on screen as a product of the character's own imaginations. Look at some of Ghibli's most memorable films, and it's clear the studio is asking viewers of any age to consider the reality of what they're watching. My Neighbor Totoro puts childhood innocence in a fragile position from its get-go. The film follows a family who relocates to an old country house so young sisters, Satsuki and Mei, will be near to their mother, who's being treated for an unspecified illness at a hospital. Cute spirits soon lure Mei out through a briar patch where she meets the title character. Totoro is a big and cuddly, but largely unexplained creature. Mei accepts him at face value, but lack of explanations leave him and his woodland cohorts open to interpretation especially since questions of who can actually see Totoro and when are stressed throughout. Pointedly, Satsuki doesn't at first, and the girl's father is never able to. A key moment comes when the girls marvel at a tree that's miraculously sprung up from magic seeds Totoro gave them to plant, all while an objective camera view reveals their dad seeing nothing there. The reality around Totoro is stressed as subjective, and later on Satsuki and Mei's shared fantasy seems to unravel. After a visit with their mother must be canceled due to some setback in treatment, May runs away, hoping to visit the hospital on her own. Somewhere along the way, she ends up disappearing. A search party forms, and there's a horrible scare when they discover what seems to be her slipper in a pond. In itself, the mere suggestion is very upsetting for a children's film. Eventually, in desperation, Satsuki calls on Totoro for help, and the search is resolved so swiftly as to feel abrupt, especially when put at the end of such a leisurely paced movie. As soon as he's asked, Totoro takes Satsuki for a brief flight over countless fields in the countryside. They spot Mei almost immediately. Both girls are brought home safely, and Totoro vanishes into the night. The pace gets so fast, in fact, that the end theme song and credits start rolling before their reunion is even complete. Could Totoro actually be a spirit escorting young souls to the afterlife? Even without a mythic slant, it's easy to interpret these scenes as a guilt-ridden Satsuki imagining how she wished the search for Mei ended if her little sister had actually died. There's even an odd detail where the girls eavesdrop on the hospital and hear their mother has only had a minor cold this whole time, and she's already better. Oh, she's laughing. Everything must be okay. Yeah. It's hard to buy that putting anybody in the hospital, let alone for long enough to require a family's relocation. If Satsuki's mother did die from a worse disease, though, that would be another soothing fantasy to imagine. Ghibli famously released Totoro as a double feature with Grave of the Fireflies, which is the heartbreaking story of siblings struggling to survive in the closing months after World War II. The film is an adaptation of a semi-autobiographical manga which author Akiyuki Nosaka created as an apology to his own little sister, who died of malnutrition around the firebombing of Kobe in 1945. Nosaka had felt guilty for not doing enough to protect her, particularly the times he'd eaten food he could have shared. The film's pairing was overtly an effort to offer a happy ending in Totoro that the tragic fireflies simply couldn't provide. However, considering the film's concurrent productions, it's not a stretch to suggest that potential parallels in their plots aren't coincidental. Well, the similarities in names could be coincidental. In Totoro, the younger sister is Mei and the bigger sister is Satsuki, where in Fireflies, the little sister is Satsuko and the big brother is Seita. Toward the end of the latter film, delusion is explicitly presented as an escape from the pains of reality when Satsuko starts hallucinating due to starvation. Seita rushes to make her a meal, but she died before he had finished preparing it. After he cremates her, the film ends on an ambiguous and abstract note. Both Satsuko and Seita's spirits view the Kobe of different eras from a kind of vague heaven. Since Seita has served as the film's narrator, what's real and what's imagined is harder to distinguish during this finale. Likewise, it's impossible not to see the bridge and similarities between the plights of these two pairs of siblings. Seita looks back at Satsuko's death with guilt through a metaphoric lens. So too, could Satsuki be processing her guilt for the spat that drove Mei into danger, adopting the fantasy of Totoro to soothe herself by imagining how he could have fixed everything? As with all these films, the distinction isn't concrete. Ponyo reinterprets a classic fairy tale, Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid, and finds unexpected moments to inject realism. Specifically, the many exact steps a physical transformation a fish would go through as she turned into a girl. 
Like Totoro, it's deceptively simple and seems to have a clear cutoff point where it starts presenting pleasing fictions the lead character imagines, instead of the tragic circumstances he actually has to face. The real break from Dream to Nightmare actually circles around the job of Lisa, his mother. Lisa works at a nursing home, which is threatened by a tsunami that stirs up after Ponyo defies her wizard father by appropriating magic to enable her transformation. At a key moment when she, Ponyo, and Sasuke are huddled inside, waiting out the approaching storm, Lisa drives off to check on the home's residents, fearing for their safety. After the storm passes, Sasuke and Ponyo awaken to disaster. Their surroundings are flooded, and Lisa hasn't returned. Look at that! The ocean is at our door! They magically conjure a boat and set off to find her. That's the road my mom took last night. I don't see her anywhere. In a moment much like the discovery of May's slipper and Totoro, they find Lisa's car along the way, and it's ominously been left hey, Mom! deserted. Mom! Mommy! When the kids do finally locate Lisa, they face the surreal scene of her nursing home underwater, protected by a literal bubble. The film harps so much on the evanescent nature of magic, though, viewers have to wonder if its lapses hold greater significance. Ultimately, Ponyo's father permits her to become a human girl permanently, but on the condition she give up all her powers. So the relation of magic to childhood and its renouncement for maturity's sake is presented more overtly as a step to coming of age, one other Ghibli characters also take. Miyazaki's adaptation of Aiko Kadona's novel Kiki's Delivery Service likewise shows its title character losing and regaining powers at different points. However, it seems to conflate magic even more pronouncedly with innocence, and charts the fulfillment of a childish wish with innocence's loss. The film has an odd opening scene, even within the dream logic of children's fantasy, where 13-year-old Kiki abruptly decides she'll leave home to pursue vaguely defined training in witchcraft. Despite her bewildered parents' concerns, she speeds off to the big city without any intended place to stay, plan for what she'll do, change of clothes, or even as much as a goodbye. Fast enough, Ki has to get a job making deliveries on her flying broom. But after a while, she inexplicably loses her ability to fly, seemingly due to a lack of confidence in herself. While Gigi can still speak, he voices suspicion about Ursula, a reclusive painter Kiki meets when she has to retrieve a lost delivery. Ursula repeatedly offers to paint the girl in a portrait, and Gigi sardonically suggests she has a nude study in mind for Kiki. It's an eyebrow-raising exchange, even though it's played for laughs, and Kiki loses her powers around the time she finds a boyfriend. These developments again suggest magic as a childish thing to be put aside as one becomes an adult. When considering all these metaphoric details, it's easy to interpret the film as the manic fantasy of a teenage runaway, reminiscing on what she imagined life would be like without parents, with occasional flashes of the less than enchanted reality she had to face. In other Ghibli fantasies though, the unpleasant hardships are more all-encompassing. The studio's highest grosser, Spirited Away, has invited perhaps the most analysis out of all the films discussed here. The film's about a girl, Chihiro, who becomes indentured to work at a bathhouse for demons after her parents steal food from the spirit world and are turned into pigs for their folly. Miyazaki said he wanted the parents' greediness to critique the rampant avarice he observed around Japan's recession in the 80s. And he likewise wanted Chihiro's plight to reflect that of young women following it. Bathhouses could double as brothels in Japan historically. All of Chihiro's co-workers are females serving male customers, and their boss's name relates to a term for hot water women, or prostitutes. In such an extended metaphor, the ghoulish no-face, another enigmatic figure, would seem to represent a John. He's so taken with sense she must keep dodging his pursuits, even as he literally throws money around. I want to stress that nobody watching these films has to accept these interpretations as fact, or even keep troubling subjects in mind while enjoying such fabulously produced escapist entertainment. Reportedly, one of Miyazaki's own elders advised him that children need to see something incomprehensible and they'll understand it later. And that's an ethos he and his collaborators have applied to most all of their output. Ghibli's films are truly all ages in that they offer different levels of appeal to viewers of different ages and new dimensions of fans who rewatch after having enjoyed them on one level as children. The studio's whimsy is memorable, not flimsy, precisely because it never offers fantasies that are wholly innocuous. Anyway, let me know what you think. Do you think that a constant theme in Ghibli's films really is about separating fantasy and reality and using escapism to deal with trauma? Or do you think I'm crazy? Subscribe to Gamma Ray for more awesome content. Like, follow, do all those things. See you next time.